So yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks very much for coming along today. And thanks to Craig and Bug Life for inviting me to do this. I love telling people about spiders. I love helping people identify spiders. And I love running spider ID workshops. And this has been a bit of a weird year for that, um, for obvious reasons. But this is the second uh, remote workshop I've run in this kind of format. The first one was very successful. So hopefully this one will be even better. Um, as Craig said, I'm the director of Caledonian Conservation. I'm also an area organiser for the British Arachnological Society Spider Recording Scheme. I cover quite a big swathe of Scotland, although there are other area organisers as well. Um, so I'm always keen to get records. My background with things, um, I got into spiders. Um, they were one of my gateways to the natural world, along with beetles and reptiles and amphibians when I was maybe about six. Um, my grandfather was a miner. Um, in the northeast of England, and he used to take me pitfall trapping and looking for newts and uh, lizards and fossils and things. Um, so I've been looking at spiders for a very long time. Yeah, and that is me when I didn't have as much of a beard. And uh, that's actually the largest species of spider that occurs in Scotland and the UK, if by weight anyway, um, Arrhenius quadratus, the four spot orb weaver. And that's another fantastic spider, and it's, um, that's a cave spider, Meta Minardi. And um, people often think of them as being black and right. And this one was actually in Cadzo Castle um, in Chatelaroe Country Park. And the rangers told me about this, these big black spiders they had in the dungeons there. And obviously, when you shine a torch on them, you see that they've got a lot, a lot of pretty colours going on and markings and things. Um, and it just shows how beautiful these animals are if you take the time to look a bit more closely. So the structure for today, um, we're, I'm going to give you an introduction to arachnids, then we're going to narrow down into spiders, araniae, um, and then I'll give you a bit of an overview of spiders in Scotland, talk about a few special species. Um, they're, they've not been selected in any particular way, they're just species I think are special. We could talk about spiders all day, um, <laughs> certainly. Um, then I'll talk a bit about finding spiders and how you go about doing that, and a bit about identifying spiders. Um, in terms of, um, I guess, useful field ID tips, a lot of that's going to be in the presentation. Um, to identify most spiders to species, you need to take them back to a lab um, and look at them under a microscope. Um, and the second session um, after this, so we'll do a Q&A at the end of this presentation and then we'll um, have a break. Then we'll come back and I'll take you through some spiders under my microscope. Um, basically, when I run in person uh, courses or I'm doing university practicals, I've got two spiders that I use, or two different species that I use that are very good at picking out different elements of the most commonly used key, which is the Roberts uh, Collins field guide. Um, so we'll do that and then we'll see how much time we have afterwards. And if there are any particular groups of spiders that you would like to look at, families, then I can pick out some specimens and we can go through how to identify them. So it might be worth thinking about that while we go through the presentation. So arachnids. There are lots of different kinds of arachnids in the world. That's a sun spider, uh, Solifugae. Um, that's a, that is an animal that I had wanted to see since I was about six. I saw a picture of it in a book and thought this is the most remarkable thing. Um, and I was lucky enough to see, see them in the wild um, for the first time about 10 years ago now, I guess, in Africa. And I just got, I was so excited about that. The people I was with were like, oh my goodness, what have you found? And then they see it's this, you know, um, two inch, three inch long um, bug on the ground. and everyone else got bored and didn't quite get it. But I'm hopeful that you guys will see how exciting that animal is. So in the world, we've got these different groups of arachnids. Um, we've got Acari, Amblopigi, Arrhenia, Apelionis, Palpigrade, Pseudoscorpiones, Ricinuli, Schizomida, Scorpiones, Solifugae, Thelophonida, and Xyphosura. In Scotland, we only have these four. Um, and so we will focus in on those now. So we have spiders, Arrhenia, which is what we're going to be mainly talking about today. As you can see, they have um, two body parts. They've got uh, an abdomen and then they've got a cephalothorax. So the abdomen, uh, well, the cephalothorax has their brain and their eyes and their legs um, and their mouth. Uh, and the abdomen has the rest of their organs. Um, their cephalothorax is hard, the abdomen is soft, so spiders are quite delicate animals. Um, they have six or eight eyes as well, which is key and they produce venom and they produce silk. This is a harvestman, a polyonis, another type of arachnid that lives in Scotland. Um, and the, 
hopefully you can see they're quite different from spiders. They do have eight legs and they do have um, pedipalps, like wee arms, just like spiders, um, but they only have one body part. They only have two eyes, which are usually on a turret. Um, they don't spin silk, uh, which is relatively unusual for arachnids, um, and they don't make venom, but they are top predators. Uh, so they actually have these um, fantastic arms, the palps, uh, uh, which many have adapted with spikes um, on them and they can like grab things and crush them and their chelicerae, which are their jaws. So spiders have fangs for jaws. Their chelicerae have adapted as fangs. Um, harvestmen, they've adapted as little pincers, which are really cool. So pseudoscorpion, um, that's the Neobysium carcinoides, the moss nipper. Um, nine times out of ten, if I find a pseudoscorpion in Scotland, it's that species, whether it's in the sea, in the woods, or on top of a Munro. Um, uh, but they're, they're really cool animals. There's a few other species. Um, and as you can see, they look a bit like scorpions. Um, they're actually not very closely related. Well, obviously, scorpions are arachnids as well, um, but they don't have tails. And those that have retained venom actually um, inject that via their pincers, although some of them have lost their venom glands and have powerful claws instead, like this species. Um, and they spin silk from their jaws, from their chelicerae. So they're really quite different from, from spiders and harvestmen. And then we have ticks and mites, acari. Um, there are loads of those. I'm not a fan of ticks. They carry Lyme disease, which is no good for anyone. Um, but there's many other species of ticks um, and mites, which are not so problematic as the ones that bother us. So in terms of species, in, in the UK, there are about 660 species of spiders. And in Scotland, there's uh, 440 odd that are known. Harvestmen, there's 26 species in the UK, or I think there's actually maybe 28 or 29 now to keep finding new ones and splitting species. Um, and there's 17, 18 in Scotland, maybe 19. Pseudoscorpions, 27 species in the UK and 13 known from Scotland, although I suspect that there is probably at least 14 because there is a species which is strong, which is associated with um, sphagnum in bogs. Um, and if it doesn't occur in Scotland, that would seem quite remarkable. I haven't found it. Uh, and ticks and mites, nobody knows. Um, they're not studied in the UK except for as pest species generally. So all we know is that there are, there's tens of thousands of species. So focusing in on spiders, as I say, there's about 660 species in the UK and 442 in Scotland. There's 27 families that occur in Scotland. Um, there's 12 UK BAP species in Scotland, although, of course, UK BAP is defunct and was replaced by the Scottish Biodiversity List um, before I left university. Um, and there's eight Scottish Biodiversity List species. There are 16 red data book species, 58 nationally scarce species, um, th well, three introduced species, probably more, and eight synanthropic species. So those are associated with uh, humans. That's a list of UK bat species, and I don't really want to go through it in any detail. The kind of key take home message from them is that the majority of them are in this family Linifidae, and that family um, includes money spiders, so the tiny wee black spiders that you find kicking about. Scottish biodiversity list species are actually quite different from the UK bat species list. I'm not entirely sure why some are included in one and not the other. Um, however, um, it is what it is. There are also special habitats in Scotland, which is maybe more relevant if you're interested in looking for spiders. So we've got montane habitats that ha they don't have a lot of species, but the species that occur there tend to be um, pretty rare and special to mountain top habitats and you won't get them anywhere else. We have peatland habitats. We've got a huge peatland resource in Scotland and there are quite a few species that specialise in peat. In fact, spiders can be quite good indicators as to how, uh, as to the quality or how wet the bog is. Um, there are some genera, for instance, that have multiple species and different species have different dampness tolerances or requirements. And so you can get an idea of how damp a bog is by the um, sort of proportion of those species that you collect on a site. And there's our Caledonian forest as well, which also supports some pretty amazing and fairly unique spiders, such as this, uh, the lichen running spider, Philodromus margaritatus, a really, really awesome. 
and that's the distribution of Philodromus margaritatus. Um, so, so you can see mainly occurs in the highlands, but there's also populations down in the south of England. It's got a disjunct distribution, which is quite interesting. There's a few species that have a very similar distribution to this. Um, so it particularly occurs in the Caledonian forest. Um, it, um, it, re it requires trunks with lichen covered trees so as it can camouflage. It does have an ability to gradually change its base colour to match the lichen that it's on. Um, it's mature between May and August, so that's when you'll find adults. And it's an active hunter on tree trunks. Uh, in fact, it, as well as being able to change colour a bit, um, it's got this, these fantastic organs on its legs called scopulae, which are um, like brushes of hairs. Then the hairs bifurcate, so they branch off many, many times and give them incredible grip. So that this one here um, we found under a bark trap um, and it was very difficult to remove it from the tree because it just literally sticks so well to it. There seems to have been quite a decline in their range, so about 70% since 1992. Um, and it's nationally scarce and uh, you, on the UK backlist. So nationally notable A and B have kind of been amalgamated into uh, this nationally scarce category these days. This is not a spider. This is an ant. It's an arrow-headed wood ant, um, Formica exacta. And I've got that in there because there is this amazing spider, the wild gallows spider, Dipena torva. Um, which specializes in hunting these. Um, and in the past, people thought that um, it spun webs um, on in the fissures and trees and caught, um, caught the ants. But uh, Mike Davidson, who is a fantastic and amazing arachnologist, um, he spent a lot of time studying them and found that, in fact, they spin this um, a trip wire across where the ants are commuting up a tree and also a web out on a wee bit of branch. And then when the ants go up the tree, and hit the tripwire, they swing out and hang there, and the spider comes down and bites it through the soft part of the ant's head to inject its venom, and then basically sucks out the digested insides, uh, which is really cool. And you can see there the difference in size. In fact, um, I've found you know juvenile Dipena torva that are smaller than that, e eating full, you know, adult wood ants. Um, they're really remarkable animals. And they they are they occur pretty much in, well, just in the sort of highlands of Scotland. Um, it says there there's more than seven sites. I mean, they do they, they do turn up else, elsewhere. Um, it was thought that they were associated with Caledonian forest, but I found them um, in native woodland as well. Um, I think the key thing is that they prey on wood ants. So if there are wood ants there, then that provides the, the what's needed for the, the spider. Um, and um, as long as they can build their trip wires and things, they're just uh, wood ants are harder to find in um, broadleaf woodland just because their their nests tend to be less um, impressive. Um, so that's probably why that kind of thing gets overlooked. Um, they're mature between June and September, um, and they are a red data book species, so they're pretty rare. This is the bog sunjumper, uh, one of my absolute favourites. I've done a lot of work with this species, uh, Heliophanus dampfi. They're beautiful. They're wee, tiny wee jumping spiders that um, specialise in living in peatland habitats. And the females have these luminous green um, palps that you can see there, and their legs in the sun shine pretty much yellow. Um, and in the sunlight, both the male and the female um, shine different colours, like oily colours, purples and greens and all sorts, the rainbow. They're just beautiful. Um, they live within the tussocks in, in bogs. Um, and on sunny days, they come out and they hunt on the, on the sphagnum between the tussocks. Um, and that's their distribution. For a long time, they were thought to really be... Um, to, to really be focused, or mainly located in Scotland, um, around Stirling area, um, as well as a site in Wales. But um, recently they're, they're being found on other sites elsewhere in the country, as you can see from the map. Um, so in Scotland, this is their friend around Stirling and Falkirk. In fact, they and um, they're found in Dumfries and Galloway as well now, um, and they occur in lowland raised bogs like that. That's Octor Tire Moss, which is a site where they live. And as I was saying, they, they, they seem to shelter within these tussocks on the bog and hunt out on the open moss. 
They're mature April to July, it says there. Um, I found females this year into October at Flanders Moss, um, so you never know. And they hunt on sphagnum and other vegetation. I wonder if they overwinter in tussocks as well, because jumping spiders like this, you see they're mature in April. That's quite early for a spider. Um, so to have that early maturity um, would suggest that they are overwintering as juveniles, perhaps a, a molt or two away from adulthood. Um, and I've certainly found that to be the case with a relative um, Heliophanus flavipes. I find overwinters in tussocks on bogs at Westermoss. Um, so it wouldn't be surprising if Heliophanus dampfi does the same. And it's a red data book K, which means that we don't have enough information to know how rare it is, but we know that it is rare. Clubionus absultans, the Caledonian sack spider. It's um, a red data book species. It's also a Scottish biodiversity species, and it's found in Caledonian forest. It lives in Scots pine, um, and it's found under bark and in pine litter, and it's mature between March and September. Um, and I'll, I'll mention this a bit later on when we start <clears throat> talking about different trapping methods um, of oh, distribution. Yeah, very Scottish. Um, but what I really love about this spider is the male palps. <clears throat> I mean, I love Clobionas in general. I don't know if you've watched any of my YouTube videos, um, but you probably will get that I get excited about Clobiona. And that's partly because with the exception of one or two, um, you just don't know what you've got until you look at them under a microscope. And it's so exciting because there's such there's, some of them are quite rare um, or at least not very well recorded. Um, so I just yeah get super excited by Clubiona spiders. Um, and this has one of the best palps. So that's the male secondary sexual organ in spiders. The pedipalps, that's the arms, are modified in males for mating, um, which is a unique thing um, in the natural world as far as I'm aware. And you see there, it's the distinctive, I mean, there's various distinctive features, but the most obvious one on this palp is that um, sort of harpoon shaped um, protrusion there. Uh, it's just, it's super cool. So how to find spiders? First of all, you can, you can look anywhere. Um, I, if I want to see a spider, I know that's a goal I can achieve without leaving my house. Um, you can see them any time. There are spiders all through the year. In fact, some spiders have their adult season through the winter. Um, they tend to be quite under-recorded. So I wonder if that's because people just don't look for them. But anyway, there are spiders all of the time. But most adults are, uh, most spiders are adults in the late summer or autumn. So if you want to see the most species, that's when you'd go out and look. And there's a smaller peak in late spring and early summer as well, where you've got um, wolf spiders and uh, jumping spiders, for instance, with adults. And as I mentioned, some species break the rules. Quite a few money spiders have multiple seasons, and some of them are mature in winter. And some species are adult all year. Some spiders live for multiple years, like female house spiders. And other species have multiple generations in a year, as I mentioned, like money spiders, linifidae. Um, so, finding spiders you get out, you get a, a good way of finding them is using something like a pooter. Um, and so a pooter to describe is, and of course you can't see my cursor, but um, it's a tube that has a little tube on one end and another tube on the other. Um, and you would suck through one end and put the other end against the spider and the spider would go into the tube. And of course, you would have a valve so as the spider does not go up the tube and into your mouth. Although I've had several valve malfunctions in my life and I've tasted many different species of spiders and they do have different textures and different flavors. So basics for active searches, if you go out and look for spiders, um, a hand lens is really useful. Um, times 10 is fine. <clears throat> and also uh, um, a pooter. So you saw my pooter there. You could, a pooter doesn't have to look like that. So you get cheaper, simpler ones like this one, which kids find easy to use, but you can make your own. And yeah, there's me pooting again. I don't know why I've got me pooting twice, but I do love pooting. Another thing you can do is just literally lift up stones. Um, that's me on top of um, Ben Lea Moore Fanic in the Fanic Hills. And um, yeah, I'm using, you can see, quite large forceps. They're sold as tarantula forceps. I think they're actually intended for feeding tarantulas. But you, because they're so big, um, they're really delicate. Uh, you can pick up um, like money spiders without damaging them if you get the hang of it and you've got that kind of dexterity anyway. And you can get those into little cracks and rocks and stuff. So they, I find them to be incredibly useful. 
I only found out that they're useful as well, actually, because um, I went up to survey spiders on top of um, Liak, uh, the ridge, uh, mountain ridge near Torridon, or in Torridon, um, and I got to the, I was camping out on top of it, and I got to the top and realised I'd left my pooter in my uh, Land Rover, and I thought, well, I'm not going all the way back down to get my pooter after getting all the way up here with all my camping kit and stuff. Um, but And I had these, and so I thought I'd give those a go. And um, I, honestly, I don't use pooters on mountains anymore because they're far more effective around rocky habitat. Um, pitfall traps, um, commonly used. Uh, different people have different designs. Um, I use um, a, a sturdy plastic cup with some holes for drainage so as they hopefully don't overflow too often. <clears throat> And I put chicken wire over the top that I dig into the ground to try and prevent um, mammals or other vertebrates from falling in. And I generally use antifreeze um, there, and a drop of washing up liquid to break the tension to preserve, kill and preserve things. Um, if you don't use anything to kill stuff, then um, you really need to check your traps on a daily basis and you will end up with some, you know, big beetles, and big centipedes because they're having a good old time eating everything that falls in with them. Um, whereas if you use antifreeze, you can leave them out for up to a month. Sweep netting, there's my colleague Neil, um, a very proficient sweep netter. So just taking a robust net and r running it through vegetation um, and seeing what you get. And you can similarly beat trees. So you could um, you could take a, a sweep net like that and put a bunch of branches in it and really shake it and see what comes out. Or you could get a, a large sheet and lay it under a tree and just really rock that tree and see what falls out onto your sheet. This is a bark trap. It's a very good way of finding species which uh, live under or within the cracks of bark on trees. So it's basically a double layer of bubble wrap um, folded over itself with some black plastic to block out light, wrapped around a tree, and then you leave it there for at least a month and you come back and you take it off the tree and um, invertebrates that would normally live um, under bark and in the cracks will have moved into that space between the trap and the tree. And then also when you open it out, there will be others inside there as well. Um, it's, it's a really cool thing to do. It's good fun. It's really fun for kids as well, actually. I've done this with my kids and they loved it. Um, you don't get a great diversity, but what you do get is very hard to get any other way, such as, as we've mentioned, the lichen running spider. Um, that is far, that's pretty hard to find searching for it. Believe me, I can tell you, I've spent a lot of hours just actively searching for this species and it isn't very productive. Bark traps are far more effective. Uh, this is a nest box. So this is like a bee nest box, basically. Um, and this brings us back to Clubiona subsultans, the, um, the Caledonian sack spider. So what, at one point I was um, working on a project where we were looking for a solitary bee called Osmia uncinata. Um, and there was various literature published about it, including a study which had looked for it in the Caledonian forest in the same area that we were surveying. So that was like really great. That hardly ever happens. Um, and they'd used these nest boxes to try and find it. And they had found that these nest boxes are not a good way of finding Osmia and Sonata. However, unlike a lot of other projects, they gave their bycatch to people to identify and they included that in their um, in their report. Um, and something it did find quite frequently was female Clubiona subsultans. Um, so we, so I, well, I've used this um, to find Clubiona subsultans specifically, and it's very effective. Females um, build retreats in it. Males don't use them. Um, but adult males wander and look for mates, so they tend to turn up under bark traps instead. Um, but the, yeah, fem this is just such a good way of finding them and other species of spider that like that kind of habitat to make a retreat or to, um, yeah, basically. So you never know what's going to work. Bark brushing, that just gets bugs out from between cracks of trees. Bug vacking, one of my favourite activities in life. It's just amazing. Um, so it's like a, an industrial pooter. It's a modified leaf blower um, and you have a net on the end. Oh, what's going on? Yeah, and you suck up. Um, it just sucks everything up. It doesn't tend to kill things um, and you empty your net out and you can select what you take, which I find great because obviously you can choose to take adults. Um, if you can recognize adults for, uh, anyway, and that avoids killing juveniles that you might not be able to identify. Malaise traps are also a way that you can find spiders. They're really designed as flight interception traps, but spiders do fall into them. It tends to be a low diversity though, and you get an awful lot of, um, of bycatch 
So I wouldn't recommend this as a way of looking at spiders, but it does give you good time series data. So this is stuff that was provided to me by David Price some time ago, um, who also introduced me to bug vax, by the way. Um, so I'm and also to those tarantula uh, forceps. So uh, yeah, I owe David a lot. And you can also sweep water. So there are quite a few um, invertebrates that live well there's quite a few invertebrates live in water of course um but there are spiders that hunt on top of the water and there's also spiders that live in the water one species that lives in the water so this is a species that hunts on top of the water it's called pirata piraticus the uh, the pirate otter spider um, and they're relatively under recorded this is the species that i have given to other arachnologists for the reference collections most often um, so I think that kind of suggests that arachnologists don't tend to survey water very much. Um, I find them frequently when I'm torching for great crested newt surveys. And this is um, the raft spider, uh, Dolomedes fimbriatus. Um, so there's two species of Dolomedes in the UK. One is very rare, one is more common, and the more common species occurs in Scotland, but is pretty rare up here, but maybe under-recorded. So there's some things about finding spiders. Spider anatomy is important if you're going to identify a spider. So as I mentioned, they've got um, a, sort of a head body combined, which is the cephalothorax, which has their eyes and their legs and their palps and their jaws and their brain. Um, and then the, you've got the abdomen, which has everything else and is like a sack of blood, and which makes them very delicate. Um, and they have their spinnerets on the end of that. Flip a spider over. And there are various features, and in females, critically, there's um, there, there's the epigyne, at least in spiders that have epigynes, not all of them do. And that's a, a unique sclerotized structure, uh, which is used in mating. And in the males, you've got, the on the end of the palps, um, a modified organ, which is used in mating. And basically, the epigyne and the male palp work like a lock and key thing. Um, now, the... Not all groups of spiders have epigynes. Almost all spiders in Scotland do, but there are group, there are some that do not, and that can make identification of females a bit trickier. Um, and so all males have some form of modified palp, and the palp, male palps tend to be more unique than female epigynes, at least without dissection. Um, so males are better for a confident identification generally. However, um, females are easier when you get started because turning a spider on her back and looking at her um, upper skirt is a lot easier than manipulating a, a spider's arms into the right position to look at a complicated um, male genital, basically, secondary sexual organ. So, identifying spiders. There's two suborders. There's orthognatha, which is sometimes referred to as megalomorphae. And there's Libidignatha, which is sometimes referred to as Areniomorphae. And the key difference between these groups is the way that their chelicerae, their fangs, work. Um, so in um, megalomorphs, the fangs bite backwards, and in Areniomorphs, they pinch in sideways. Uh, and yeah. And also, uh, megalomorphs are basically um, tarantulas, and Areniomorphs are almost everything else. There's only one uh, megalomorph in Scotland, um, one family, one species, and it's Aetipus hafinus, the purse web spider. And it's only known from Dumfries and Galloway in Scotland. I don't think it's been recorded recently. Um, I've tried to find it um, at its old sites before and not succeeded, although one of them seems to have been built on. Um, but it may be present elsewhere. It's quite hard to find. Um, so these are some photos taken by Nick Nimbus, who's an awesome photographer. Um, and that's one on his hand um, just to give an idea of size. Their, their chelicerae are pretty big, but you wouldn't generally see them. So this is their web. Um, it's sometimes called a dirty finger because it's about the size of your finger um, a lot, and it runs along the top of the ground and it's decorated with vegetation, which makes it very hard to spot. Um, that tube then runs along and goes down to the ground, up like 60 centimetres underground in, in, a, um, in a retreat, and the spider lives under there and waits for something to walk across the top of the web, feels the vibrations, comes up, bites through, 
and pulls its prey in. Um, they're very receptive to tuning forks I've found. So tuning forks can be a great way of finding spiders. You know, bang them off something, touch the web, and spider thinks it's caught prey and comes running out. Um, so that works quite well for these guys, but all you see are these little black fangs pinching through, biting the tuning fork. Very cool spider. Otherwise, there are 32 families of um, areniomorphs in Scotland, uh, sorry, in the UK, and there's 27 in Scotland. So um, all of the, those in red do not occur in Scotland. Um, the rest of them do, and it's beyond the scope of today for us to go through all of these families. If there are any particular families you want to have a look at, let me know, think about it now, and I can try and dig out a specimen if I have one with me at home um, for the second session. Something that often gets forgotten um, when identifying spiders and isn't dealt with very effectively in many books is their webs. Spider webs are pretty unique, at least to families, those that do build webs. So, for example, here are two different orb webs. Uh, the top one is made by an arenid, so like a garden cross spider. Um, and the bottom one is made by a tetragnathid, another group of uh, orb weavers, long-jawed orb weavers. Um, and just from looking at those webs, I would know which family I've got, um, which is good to start with. Um, the difference here is that in the centre of the web, if you can see um, the top web, the Arrhenid web, has this tangled mess of silk, um, whereas the bottom web, the tetragnathid web, has a nice clear hole. Um, basically, a tetragnathid chews out the tangled web um, afterwards and often will sit, in fact, in the middle with its um, shorter legs spread over this gap and its long legs hanging down in the front. Um, but yeah, useful identification thing. Here's a oh, there we go. That's the one I want. Here's a couple of um, of tunnel webs. Um, so this is or tube web type things. The top one is um, um, an amorobius web, a uh, window lace weaver, um, and the bottom one is a suggestria web. Um, they're sometimes called snakeback spiders um, because of the pattern on their back. Uh, looks a bit like an adder. Um, you can see there's a difference. The top one is quite a messy, a mess of blue silk, um, and the bottom one has these neat spokes that run out. They both respond very well to tuning forks, by the way. Um, tap a tuning fork to those, and they'll come charging out. And there's various other things. So that's um, like uh, so. The top one there is a hammock web. Um, so that would be a web made by, for example, um, well, a, a money spider. Basically, any kind of linified will look similar to that in structure, bigger or smaller. And the bottom one is a therided web. Um, I find uh, linified and therideds look very similar. Um, uh, it certainly did when I started identifying spiders. I'm a bit better at that now. Um, uh, but their webs give you a real key. So looking at those first can help you, um, you know, not waste a lot of time under, by the microscope when you're starting out. Um, so the therided web is this fantastic three-dimensional structure. Um, people used to think that it was um, a very primitive web, but um, at the moment, uh, evolutionary uh, thinking on spiders is that that's one of the most complicated webs that there is one of the most advanced ones and it's built very specifically for the place that it is and there's all sorts of other things um i'd be surprised if you find that top web ever um but if you do please tell me um it's like a wee disc that's covered in vegetation again with a tunnel underneath it and that's a, actually a ladybird spider web but ladybird spiders have never been found in scotland unfortunately this is a nursery web spider sitting on its web, um, but you'd sometimes find the web without the spider. Um, basically, the mother um, spins a web around her egg sac and then guards that um, until she dies or the young hatch and can fend for themselves. Um, they do often get eaten by birds. And a couple of years ago, there was a very dry summer, um, a very hot summer surveying um, in England. And we found quite a lot of desiccated spiders. So I guess that the mothers were just sitting out there in the sun doing their duty, protecting their young and drying out. It's a bit sad. Uh, this is a, a cave spider. Um, but the key thing to look at is that egg sac. It's ping pong ball sized and they persist for a long time after they've hatched as well. Um, and you don't often, you don't always see the spider. So if you go into a cave or a dungeon or whatever and look up and see a bunch of ping pong ball sized things, then um, you know that you've got cave spiders there. 
And this is a really cool one. This is actually a, a zebra spider, um, Salticus senecus, uh, egg ret retreat um, in bark on a tree in an orchard. Um, so the female um, builds this retreat, lays her eggs in it, and stays there and protects them until they hatch and she dies. And this is another egg sac. It's a really, really cool one. It's an Agreca um, egg sac, um, lantern spiders, um, and that's in the Caledonian forest. And during that particular survey, we didn't find the spider, but we did find the egg sac, so we knew it was there. The eyes I find really useful um, in identifying spiders. So they all have a range of... Um, sorry. Um, I've got notifications popping up on my screen. I hope that you don't see those also. Um, so this uh, eyes are quite different in spiders. So the, the top left one there um, is a jumping spider, and so is the top um, right. So you can see the different eye arrangements. Um, jumping spiders are the only spiders that we have in the UK that actually form an image like our eyes do. So when a jumping spider is looking at you, it is really looking at you. Um, below that on the left is uh, wolf spider, so they're also active hunters, and, um, but they can't form as good an image, they're more light sensitive. Um, spiders use other senses to hunt. Um, and at the bottom, uh, bottom left, is um, an orb weaver, like a garden cross spider, an arenid. And then two at the bottom right, I find to be, uh, well, I found the eye arrangement to be really key in me cracking these when I was learning how to identify spiders. Um, so I find that these look similar, um, these two families. The top one is Naphosidae and the bottom one is Clubionidae. Um, they're both nocturnal hunters and like I say I feel that they look similar. You, you guys may not, we all see things differently. Um, but as you can see Naphosidae have these kind of slanted eyes um, whereas Clubionids have these round ones and once I got that um, identification became so much easier. And yeah don't look at the colours much because all of these spiders on this slide are the same species. They're um, Metalina segmentata. Metalina mengei looks um, effectively the same as well. So as you can see, there can be quite a diversity. And were we doing this course in person, we would have an outdoor session and you guys would go out and find some spiders. And I'm pretty sure that we would get a lot of these that all look very different. Shape though is pretty important. So here's a few different families of spiders. I'll maybe go through them as I pop them up this time. It might be easier without having a pointer. Um, so the top left there is a woodlouse spider, Disteridae. Next along, we've got a philodromid spider, a running crab spider. That's a Fulcidae, um, so a daddy long leg spider. That's a jumping spider, a Salticidae. A crab spider, Timicidae. And that's a, a theridid spider, therididae. Um, as you can see, the, their bodies are all very different. And so you can get a good idea of what you've got from the general shape of a, a spider. Helps you narrow it down. And yeah, you never know what you're going to find. So keep an open mind. This is uh, Nigma puella, the bleeding heart spider. Um, and I found that at Flanders Moss a couple of years ago. quite, uh, And I found it again last year. So, so it does definitely live there. Um, and it hadn't been found in Scotland before. I think the nearest records were two or three hundred miles south in England. So yeah, keep an open mind. And you get really cool things too sometimes. This is a, a wandering spider. It's um, Tenidae. It's, um, these, this is not a family that occurs in the UK. Um, and this came in with a shipment of bananas in Aberdeenshire. Um, it was dead on arrival. It's very unlikely that spiders can survive shipping um, just because of the environment that they keep the fruit and things in. Uh, but that was a really wonderful experience, having the spider from another country to identify. And, yeah, I ended up publishing on it as well because it turns out that um, it doesn't really have a proper description of its genitals out there. So what do you need to identify a spider? This is my setup here. Um, more or less. Um, so you, the really key is a microscope. Um, and as important as the microscope is the lighting. And we'll talk about that in a bit. So a hand lens to start with. A stereo microscope times 40 or times 90 uh, or better is ideal. I think I probably, I mean, I pro probably use about times 60 most of the time. Um, and sometimes go up to times 90 or 120 for 
money spiders. Microscope lighting, like I say, it's just as important as the microscope. If you've got a great microscope and duff lighting, you're not going to see anything. Uh, forceps, mountain needles, paper, pencil. So forceps, mountain needles to manipulate your specimens, paper and pencil to make drawings. Because the books that, that you'll be able to refer to have two dimensional drawings of three dimensional things. So I personally find it quite useful to make a drawing of a spider's genitals to compare with the drawing in the book. Certainly did to start with. Petri dishes to put your specimens in. Uh, preserved spiders as a reference collection is really critical. So when you get started and you find the spider and you think you know what it is, you send it to an expert to get it checked and he, he or she says, yes, that is that species or uh, no, you almost got it right, but it's actually this one. You can then keep that spider in the collection and refer to it in the future when you have other similar species to find out if it is the same or different. Um, to preserve spiders, a book I got given by a friend, it's a super book um, about spiders in St Vincent and the Grenadines, says to use very strong white rum and the percentages of rum that they're recommending are quite incredible. I don't think you can buy them here. But what you can buy is isopropanol or ethanol and use that about 70%. Um, isopropanol is often sold in pharmacists as a, um, a disinfectant for first aid kits. It's usually behind the counter, um, but if you're only using small quantities, that's not a bad way of getting hold of it. And you need books. Um, so ideal is Robert's uh, to start with is Robert's 1995, the Collins Field Guide that covers most spiders, just doesn't do money spiders. Um, and then Robert's 1993 um, is sort of a three volume epic that uh, Mike, Mike Roberts wrote, which is amazing and covers all the money spiders as well. And there isn't a better resource than that um, in in the UK. There's online keys as well, Spiders of Europe. Um, that can be a really useful resource, but the, 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 it has pictures from loads of different books, so you get different people's perspectives on what genitals look like on spiders, which I find very useful. So I don't actually find that I see epigynes and pedipalps in quite the same way as Roberts has drawn them often. I actually find um, a Swedish author, Almquist, um, that he draws the genitals more like how I see them. Um, so it can be quite useful to look at that. Um, but it's important to remember that it does include all of the spiders in Europe. So you could easily go down wrong routes and come out with a spider that really isn't the one that you've got in front of you. After you've identified your spider, you can record it. So you need to know what this what what you've got. Genus is fine. Species is ideal. Where you found it, so a grid reference, location name, and if you can include habitat information, that can be useful. The spider recording scheme can take habitat info. And the date you found it, and who you are. Who you are is quite important. Um, it will give whoever is verifying the record an idea of um, your level of skill, and also will hopefully allow them to contact you if they have any questions. And retain voucher specimens so as others can check your IDs, especially if it's something rare or something from somewhere you wouldn't have expected. You send the records to your local record centre if you have one, and you can also send it into the British Retinological Spider Recording Scheme. Um, and I would really suggest it's worth signing up for an account with them as well. It's free to do, and if you sign up, it lets you interrogate the data online at a much higher resolution, so you can see exactly which spiders were found in your local area and when they were found. And it also includes habitat information, so the habitats that species are most frequently found in, the times of year they're most frequently found. It's just an invaluable resource. And yeah, that really takes us back round to how to ID spiders, which is what we will do next. So um, again, this is just spider anatomy, just to hold in mind the two main body parts, the cephalothorax and the abdomen and then also the male palp and the female epigyne as being key in ID. And I've included quite a few photos in there that were given to me kindly by uh, Nick Nimbus, who um, has an Instagram and just said, if I was showing you pictures, please encourage you to follow him on Instagram. And I would say, do that because the photos are great. This is a club, uh, oh, sorry, a chiracanthium that's um, eating some insect eggs is pretty awesome. So he's got all sorts of cool life um, stage photos. And that is the end of the presentation. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Brilliant.
Thank you very thank much, you. Chris. That was fascinating.